वेलकम टू हिस्टोरिकली स्पीकिंग माय नेम इज जयवर्धन सिंह एंड इन दिस पॉडकास्ट वी टॉक अबाउट एवरीथिंग दैट इज हिस्ट्री सो इन दिस स्पेस आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द हाउ यू नो किंगशिप एज ए इंस्टीट्यूशन अंडरवेंट ए सिग्निफिकेंट चेंज फ्रॉम द वैदिक पीरियड टू द गुप्ता और द लेटर गुप्ता पीरियड नाउ बिफोर वी टॉक अबाउट द uh the this uh, the change in the institution of kingship i think it is important to first uh, understand that uh, whenever we are talking about a particular institution or particular term let's say monarchy there is a significant change from whether whether we are talking about the monarchy of let's say the gupta period and uh, whether we are talking about the monarchy of let's say the mauryan period to give you an example uh, when we talk about uh, the uh, the mauryas uh, we have the inscription of ashok now in ashokan inscription uh, i think most of us know that uh, ashok calls himself raja magadhe now we all know that you know ashok had a great empire and uh, and uh, and he was you know he also uses the term a jambu dweep in 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 his inscription but he does not calls himself lord of jambu dweep uh, or raja of jambu dweep he calls himself raja magadhe now compare this to the uh, gupta emperors who had the title of uh, param bhagavat dev raja or the kushanas who who had the title of dev putra so you know this uh, these uh, pompous titles of the later rulers suggest that you uh, how the guptas viewed uh, viewed the institution of kingship and how the mauryas viewed the institution of kingship there was a significant difference between these two uh, understanding so uh, basically uh, in this whole uh, talk i am going to argue that uh, the institution of kingship underwent an evolution from the vedic period to the later gupta period now the main uh, reference or source of this talk is a is is an article by r s sharma r s sharma in his article the title of the article is quite interesting and i have borrowed the title of this talk uh, the title is from gopati to bhupati so in this title uh, sorry in this article what Sh- r s sharma does is that he he tries to uh, tries to explain the how the institution of kingship underwent a change from the gupta from the vedic period to the gupta period so the title of gopati uh, uh, so the uh, this title of gopati is used for the rajan of the vedic period and the title of bhupati appears in later text and particularly the text of the gupta and later gupta period so Uh, basically we are going to talk about this uh, title and how r s sharma has tried to understand this evolution of kingship in ancient india so first let's uh, let's talk about the you know rajan of the vedic period now the term rajan appears in the vedic period and the frequency of uh, of this term appearing suggest that uh, you know the rajan was an important uh, part of the vedic society but whenever we read you know the translation of vedic uh, hymns where rajan appears scholars have translated rajan as king so because of this there is a misunderstanding that rajan was the uh, was the king of the vedic period now this would suggest that you know whatever we think of what a king should do and what are the powers that are associated with the kings is also the same with the rajan of the vedic period so for example you know uh, what we see is that uh, there is there is an allusion that the institution of monarchy was well established in the vedic period but as we will see that this is not the case now uh, to understand this we have to first understand that uh, you know the term rajan itself and how it is derived so for example uh, there are two different views of how should we view the term rajan so for example we have this uh, term rajan uh, which uh, some scholars believe that this was 
derived from an Indo-European -Euro stem and which basically means to proceed in a straight line or uh, f uh, to proceed in a straight line for the selection of some site for settlement or for religious structure. So this is one view of how the term Rajan is derived. Whereas other scholars have tried to uh, try to you know understand this term Rajan from the Sanskritic point of view. So in Sanskrit, it is generally under understood that the term Rajan is derived from the root Raj or the root Ranj. So the, the root Raj means to shine, whereas the root Ranj means to paint, to decorate, to charm. So basically, in the classical Sanskrit, the term Rajan uh, means to please, uh, to please the people. But uh, whether we are talking about, you know, these Sanskritic terms, we should understand that mo in most of these cases, these terms, could uh, the meaning that is associated with the term Rajan, which we see in these, uh, you know, Sanskritic terms, could not be applied to the Vedic uh, Vedic Rajan because uh, the meaning as uh, as I have dis uh, I have said that you know the term Rajan literally means someone who shines or you know uh, who's who's uh, who shines among many so this would suggest that basically he uh, uh, this is talking about a special uh, a special person who has you know some great qualities so basically a ruler but we will see that this cannot be applied uh, this meaning cannot be applied to the rajan of the vedic period and what i and also rs sharma argues in his article that the rajan of the vedic period was not a king in the traditional sense he was a tribal leader if we you know uh, stick with the uh, uh, with this view that the term rajan is derived from the indo european uh, stem which means to you know uh, to proceed in a straight line for the selection of some site for settlement or religious structure this would suggest that the rajan of the vedic period if if we are going to stick with this uh, uh, this view that the rajan of the vedic period all uh, had you know uh, two basic roles so the first was the role of uh, a priest and the second was the role of a warlord so basically we are talking about a tribal leader who combined the function of priest and warlord so now in the vedic text when we read vedic text it we can clearly see that you know there are some instances where a Rajan also has the role of warlord, uh, warlord, which is expected, but he also perform, performs the duty of Purohit. So, uh, in the view of R.S. Sharma, the term Rajan of the Vedic period was closer to the Indo European, uh, uh, Indo European meaning. And not the classical meaning, which means to, you know, to, the, the term Rajan in the classical Sanskrit means to shine or to please people. Uh, in, this is what uh, it means in the classical Sanskrit. So this is one aspect of how, you know, the term, uh, the Rajan of the Vedic period was different from the Rajan of the classical period. Then what we see is that in the, in the early Vedic text, particularly the Rig Ved, we see uh, the term another term is used for Rajan and this term is Janasya Gop and Gopati. Now Janasya Gop means herder of people and Gopati means uh, lord of cattle or a herder of cattle. Now according to R.S. Sharma both of these terms suggest that the duty of Rajan in the in the early Vedic period was to protect or look after the tribe. So here the term Jan, so Janasya Gopa is the, is the, you know, another name of Rajan. So Jan here is used for, for the tribe, which is comprised of different clans. Now, another term which appears is Janarajan. 
so here we can see that you know the term rajan uh, sorry the term jana is used for a tribe that is comprised of several clans now interestingly this term uh, this term jana and its association with the with rajan is also uh, is can also be seen in mahabharat and uh, what we see is that in both mahabharat and ramayan the term janeshwar is used so here you can see you know how in the later vedic period the term is used to suggest that he is now the lord of uh, the jan whereas this was not the case in the rigved so in uh, so you can see how you know there is this difference between the view of uh, the, the rajan in the vedic period and and the rajan of the later vedic period so this is one aspect now there is another aspect uh, which uh, which suggest that uh, the rajan of the vedic period was not the king in a traditional sense so here i'm going to talk about a term which is used for rajan in the rigveda so rigveda uh, has this term vishpati and uh, vish according to some scholars meant uh, clan in the rigveda so or settlement so basically settlement of kinsmen is called vish and rajan is called vishpati or you know uh, so here again we can see that you know this was not a king in the traditional sense now basically uh, what we are seeing is that uh, here the main role of rajan in the vedic period was as a protector of people and in nowhere we find that you know uh, great qualities uh, are assigned to rajan and the title of rajan itself was not hereditary but in the later vedic period we see that you know this uh, uh, the meaning associated with rajan has undergone a significant change so what we see is that there are two uh, two aspect of rajan which can be clearly seen in the vedic uh, in the later vedic literature so first is the territorial aspect and the second is tribute collecting aspect so first we will talk about you know the territorial aspect of rajan so what we find is that Uh, in the later vedic period we have you know great uh, great details of coronation ceremony so basically the you know different uh, yagnas like rajasuya ashvamed and vajpay these are all described in great detail in the later vedic text and in all cases uh, this is uh, this is these uh, these sacrifices are used to suggest uh, you know to to assign a special quality to the rajan and what we find is that uh, apart from you know describing these uh, sacrifices in great detail in the later vedic text another term is used uh, is is uh, you know uh, a term is appearing and this term is quite interesting and this term is rashtra now the term rashtra is basically you know means a territorial area it should not be you know confused with the rasht in how we uh, we we view it today now this this you know this uh, this change or this appearance of this term rasht is quite important and it suggests that you know now the vedic society is not pastoral anymore the uh, the uh, the new settlements are coming up and uh, the sedentary nature of the society can also be seen from this term and and we see that you know the rajan is now described as uh, now before we talk about rajan i think it is important that because of this uh, this you know sense of territorial uh, it it a settlement is appearing in the later vedic period we see that you know the role of purohit or priest is also you know uh, is significantly changed so in the brahmanas we, which is a you know part of later vedic literature uh, a brahmanas uh, tell uh, have this term called rashtra gop and this term rashtra gop which uh, uh, which means you know uh, which is used to suggest that uh, this person was protector of a kingdom or lord of a kingdom 
Now, this term Rashtra Gop is not used for Rajan, which we, we would assume, assume that this would be used for Rajan, but it is used for the Purohit. And for Rajan, the term which is used is Rashtra Bhrit, which means sustainer of the king or Rashtrin, which means, you know, possessing or occupying a kingdom. So it is interesting that, you know, how for the Purohit, Purohit is, is described as the protector of the kingdom, whereas the, the Rajan of the later Vedic period is described as the sustainer of kingdom. So, you know, here again, you can see how we should not view the Rajan of even the later Vedic period as equal to the king in the traditional or classical period. Now, the term Janpad, which we all know and have heard, does not, uh, does not indicate the lordship uh, so it is not used in the uh, uh, this term Janpad is not associated with the Rajan. And uh, now this is quite clear because as we have discussed that uh, there was no concept of, you know, Rajan being the lord of the of a particular region. But uh, by the time of the epics, we see that in both Ramayana and Mahabharat, this association of Janpad with Rajan is appearing and uh, we have terms like Janpadeshwar, Janpadasya Ish. So these two terms appear in Mahabharat and in Ramayana we have this term Janpada, uh, Janpadadhip. So both of these terms, uh, both of these, you know, texts suggest that from the, let's say the the period when the Brahmanas were written and from the period uh, to the period of epics, the Rajan and the powers that were associated with the Rajan has undergone a significant change. So basically uh, what we see is that the territorial aspect of Rajan is appearing. So uh, to, you know, uh, to sum up what we have discussed, basically in the early Vedic period, so the period when uh, which which is mentioned in the Rig Veda, in the Rig Veda we see that only the, uh, the the term Rajan is used for a tribal leader, and there is no other uh, you know uh, other roles that are assigned to Rajans, true uh, to, to the Rajan. And sometimes we see that uh, the Rajan has both uh, Raj the term Rajan is used for for both a warlord and also a priest. So someone who has both of these duties. But in the later Vedic period, we see that, you know, this, uh, this is not the case anymore. The Rajan of the later Vedic period is associated with uh, a particular territorial entity. So this is the territorial aspect of the Rajan of the later Vedic period. But we also see that in the later Vedic period, there is also another aspect of Rajan and this is the tribute collecting aspect. Now, before we talk about the tribute that uh, that was collected by the Rajan in the later Vedic period, uh, first let's discuss about, uh, let's discuss the tribute itself. So the term Bali appears in both the Rig Veda in the, and in the later Vedic text. So the term Bali in the Rig Veda, most scholars believe that this was not a compulsory offering. And in, in the case of Rajan of the Vedic period, uh, in the early Vedic period particularly, the Rajan was not entitled for Bali. So Bali is basically, you know, a tribute. But in the later Vedic period, we see that now, you know, this Bali has become compulsory and uh, the Rajan was required uh, to have his uh, his share. And this, you know, uh, this aspect can, this tribute collecting aspect of Rajan can be clearly seen in Shatapata Brahmana. And uh, so this is quite interesting because Shatapata Brahmana uses a term called Vishwamatta. So Vish, uh, sorry, Vishamatta. So Vishamatta basically means eater of the wish. So wish we have discussed means uh, people. So he here the, the term literally means eater of people. And uh, we can assume that this would suggest that uh, this talks about, you know, 
that uh, the rajan is is entitled for some kind of tribute and uh, uh, this can also be seen from other reference in the later vedic period where we uh, where we can be pretty sure of the fact that bali bali, bali has now become compulsory there is this uh, uh, this two view new view which has emerged in the later vedic period one is the territorial aspect and the second is the tribute collecting aspect now this does not mean that you know the earlier definition of rajan is no longer used so rajan is still uh, you know described as the protector of people but he is also uh, he also has rights over you know some share that uh, the people were producing so there is a dichotomy so the dichotomy is that uh, on the one hand rajan is described as the protector of the people or wish on the other hand the rajan is described as the eater of the wish as shatapata brahman would, would say vishamatta so this dichotomy is solved in the dharma sutras so dharma sutras they, when they talk about you know the origin of kingship they had this view that uh, and particularly you know when they try to explain why a king should have to, uh, why one should pay tribute to the king so what dharma sutras tell us is that the king is entitled for tribute because he protects the people so basically you know the this dichotomy that on the one hand the rajan is the protector of the people and on the other hand he also collects tribute from the people so this dichotomy is solved in the later vedic uh, in the dharma sutras by saying that because you know uh, because Ra rajan is protecting people he had also the right to collect tribute now this is what rs sharma has argued and uh, interestingly you know he tells us uh, why you know this whole uh, change happened and he uses a marxist terminology he tells us that you know this this has to do with the fact that uh, there was this emergence of new occupational group and basically uh, he is talking about household peasant production unit so uh, so you know you can uh, under uh, clearly see that the use of marxist terminology so so uh, in a you know easily we could understand it as as the fact that in the early vedic period the there was this tribal group and it is the tribal group that uh, that was the basic uh, you know unit but by the time of the later vedic period we see that you know this tribal uh, tribal group no longer existed and now the basic unit is a peasant household now this is uh, here i am using you know a marxist view which has some you know uh, which we can assume uh, which i believe that there are Uh, some things which could be explained by using this uh, 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 this terminologies these terminologies so this is what we see you know uh, so because you know there was no longer a tribal entity we see that uh, a new meaning is associated with uh, with uh, the term rajan and this can also be seen from the fact that uh, in the in the later vedic uh, period new terms are also appearing that would you know that describes uh, that is associated with uh, rajan so these new terms uh, which emphasize the lordship over all the people these terms are you know nrip nripati nareshwar narendra naradhipa so all of these terms you know they no they no longer you know talk about uh, the protecting aspect they are basically talking about you know lordship over uh, over 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 the people so this is you know so you can clearly see that there is this uh, uh, clear shift between how rajan is viewed in the early vedic period and how the rajan is viewed in the later vedic period now by the time of the mauryan and later mauryan period we see that uh, there is another uh, another meaning 
that is associated with rajan and this is the uh, this uh, this new uh, aspect of the rajan is protector or defender of dharma and sometimes we also have evidence to suggest that now one of the roles of rajan was the protection of chatur varna this can be seen from the inscription of gautami putra satakarni where he talks about that he is the preserver of chatur varna so this new aspect that is the pre- uh, protector or defender of dharma or protector or defender of chatur varna is quite interesting and uh, you know Uh, the uh, the first instance of this term appears in in mahabharat where we all know yudhishthir has this uh, this title of dharmaraja so this uh, this you know this uh, this association has started in the later vedic period and by the time of the post modern period uh, the kushanas had this title of dharma sthit so you know this association with dharma is also present in the kushanas in in you know kushan uh, uh, kushan period and we have also talked about how you know the satvahanas had also this association that the satvahana ruler kautami putra satakarni claims that he is the defender of chatur varna of or varna order so this is the uh, you know new aspect which uh, which is emerging in the post modern period but by the time of the gupta and post gupta period one of the most interesting change happened in the in the meaning of rajan and this uh, you know this was not a you know a completely new uh, new invention this can be seen uh, this new aspect of kingship can be seen in manu smriti and uh, manu uh, calls the king bhumer adhipati so bhume uh, the, so this term bhumer adhipati literally means lord of the soil now this is uh, this term is quite impor- uh, important important because this suggest a new kind of uh, uh, this suggest a, the idea of territorial lordship uh, which which is not you know uh, which for the first time is clearly meant uh, clearly used in in a particular text and uh, this is d- this is quite different from the you know later vedic uh, later vedic terminologies where uh, where the rajan was not uh, was not viewed as the lord of the earth but in manu manu tells us that he is the lord of the soil and according to manu now manu Uh, tells us that one should pay tribute or tax to the king not uh, because uh, so the reasoning which manu provides is that one should pay taxes to the king because uh, because he own the king owns the land and that is why the people had to pay tax now this is a new definition when we compare it to you know the dharma sutras who had this view that the king is entitled for tribute because he protects the people but according to manu he tells us that the king is the lord of the soil and that is why he uh, he is also entitled for taxes right now this this is a quite significant change which we can clearly see because you know the protecting of the people part Or, or the role this role of the king is now is now you know is now nowhere to be found and uh, and this uh, this you know new aspect of kingship is clearly seen in katyayan uh, who wrote his uh, who is also in you know, a, a who wrote his commentary uh, so this uh, the text of katyayan dates back to around 6th century ad so in this in his text katyayan tells us that the king is entitled to one fourth of the produce as tax because he is bhu swami so here again you know according to katyayan the king is the lord of the earth now both of these two terms whether manu is talking about you know the bhume radhipati and uh, the term that is used by katyayan uh, bhu swami 
both of these terms would appear quite similar but according to rs sharma uh, there is a great difference between these two terms in the term, in katyayan uh, the term which is used is bhu swami and this uh, this you know term swami is quite important because swami is a legal term that is used in law books to indicate legal ownership so by using this term bhu swami katyayan is clearly associating the ownership of the land to the king you know so there is you know a clear distinction in katyayan that the king is someone who owns the land now this view of katyayan is not you know the only view which is present there are when we look at uh, the you know Uh, the law books of the gupta period and also the inscriptions it would tell us that uh, the king did not own the entire land instead the peasant or the people also had ownership of the land so this would mean that uh, there existed two what we can say that there, there existed two notions uh, on the ownership of land so in the first view uh, some scholars had held uh, had this view that it is the king who owns the entire land but other scholars had this view that the king and also the people owned the land so basically uh, they shared the ownership so this uh, this view that uh, uh, so uh, so th so there is, we can clearly see that there are two different views so the first is royal ownership of the land and the second is individual ownership of the land and what we see is that uh, this view of katyayan which uh, because, because he calls the king bhu swami katyayan is of the view that uh, uh, katyayan held uh, has this uh, royal ownership view so so what we see is that uh, from the later vedic period so from the early vedic period where the king is called gopati that means you know protector of the people to the uh, to the view of katyayan who ta who talks about bhu swami or let's say manu who calls him uh, uh, who who calls him you know bhume radhipati so here you can see you know how there is this clear evolution of how the king is understood in the vedic uh, in the ancient indian period so from the vedic period to the uh, to the gupta period there is a clear evolution of the institution of kingship and how the people of the ancient period thought what role a king has to play so this is i think a basic overview of how the institution of monarchy underwent a significant change